what to do in a heart emergency. I'm super excited to hear from our speaker tonight. First, I do want to share with you a couple things. First off, why we have these educational events. These educational events are part of our mission here for the cardiovascular team. Our mission is to take care of the hearts of our community so that people live happier and healthier lives. So that's what all of these programs revolve around. And um, one of the things that we're going to be offering, adding to, as you know, we've been offering lipids before heart to heart education events, but it's been challenging to offer them to everybody who's wanted them. And so we're going to try offering them on some specific dates. You see those on the screen. Um, and we're going to try this out. And we've already got feedback tonight. We're going to switch October 9th, the Monday, to Bettner location. So if that's easier for you to get to, um, you can schedule. We are scheduling them from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, the advantage of that is that you, you know, can schedule the time. You get the time. You also can fast. Um, the triglyceride is one of the lipid uh, values that is best when you fasted for 12 hours. So it's pretty tough to fast all day and wait until the heart to heart. So, um, so that would be an advantage there. Um, also, um, we really encourage you to think about getting your lipids done and then think about what am I going to do to change them in a positive direction? Because we really want you to take ownership for your health. So you have agency with a lot of your heart health, and that's what these educational events are for. And so the lipid um, panel is a great way to try out some lifestyle change and come back in three months. It typically takes six to eight weeks of dedicated lifestyle change before you're going to see a change. So we love to see people coming back to schedule it in three months um, to see if it made a difference and if there's something else they want to add to their lifestyle changes. So um, cooking with heart classes, uh, those are ongoing. So how many of you done cooking with heart classes? We got several bases. Yes, awesome. So if you haven't done them, please consider. I'd love to have you in class. And the good thing with heart classes are really about getting together, having fun, learning how to be confident in the kitchen so that you can you can change your own recipes. Yes, the recipes are a great starting point in the classes, but really we want you to go on from there. So it's not all about the recipes in class, it's about learning the skills that you can take forward. Um, so we'll be offering uh, camp, cooking with heart for cancer in September, and then in October we'll be offering the foundational and the diabetes. These are four classes, theories, each of these. And then in November we're going to be adding um, the diabetes again. So those are coming up, so you can go to the link. You've got the information in your registration bag. So that's, um, I highly recommend that. Okay, so how to contact us? We've got an email you can see there, we've got a phone number. And then we have a monthly newsletter. If you're not getting our monthly newsletter in the um, email, then please sign up. You can um, let Randy know at the registration desk or myself or Kathy. So um, that's something that we put out once a month with some valuable heart of health information. Okay. So um, we have an event coming up in October we want to highlight. So here we have hypertension. Dr. Allah is going to be um, presenting on that. He does a great presentation. So that will be October. So um, mark your calendars for Monday, October 16th and join us there. Well, I want to get started here. I'm excited to hear Adam. Um, Adam is the um, EMS systems coordinator for Union Point Health Treasury. And he's been with the organization in this critical role since 2010. Um, and he provides medical oversight and regulations for the Quad City area for pre-hospital EMS services. And he'll tell you more about what he does. And I'm excited to hear more from him. If you could give me, help me give him a warm welcome as he gets started here. Kind of a little bit nervous because this is uh, the first time I've done um, one of these heart, heart talks, and they said, "Oh my gosh, you got a huge crowd." And I said, "Boy, really?" And this is this is a wonderful crowd. A lot of folks here uh, tonight. Um, 
to talk about um, pre-hospital um, emergency care and um, you guys, right? Part of health units. So I, I like how she went over some of their uh, mission and visions that they have in the cardiology department because they really do align and focus in with a lot of the, the missions and visions that we have for pre-hospital emergency care too. So I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. So um, I'm a, a, you know, a paramedic by trade, right? So um, I originally, um, I live across the river over in Iowa and I was originally working in a small town grocery store as a meat cutter before I decided to get into this business. And one day I had a guy that came in and they were ordering a catering for their volunteer ambulance service. He said, hey, you should just come and drive. And I said, ah, I don't know, you know. So he bugged me, bugged me, bugged me. So I said, okay, I'll come and drive. And then he goes, hey, what if we sent you to school and you got your EMP basic license and you could volunteer? I said, ah. I said, I don't know, you know, I got a wife and a bunch of little kids. And he goes, okay. So then I went to school and did that. And he goes, what if we sent you to school and got your paramedic license? And I said, well, we're already volunteering like 500, 600 hours a year now. I probably should give a little bit more, right? So sent me to school, I did that. So then uh, I ended up going to work full time, decided that I was going to do a career change. Didn't know that my wife was to be totally thrilled with me being working on 24 hours a day and then off. Two days in a row and when i finally got back uh through the ranks and back to monday through friday it was awkward uh going home and being home monday through friday i remember one time my son looked at me he goes who's this guy right <laughs> uh, because of the different work schedules that we work in the ms and stuff like that then i got a call one day from um, the hospital here in 2010 and i was super like the director of emergency services says what would you think about coming here to the hospital and being the EMS systems coordinator? And I said, I'm not going to school to be a nurse, right? <laughs> because you don't have to be a nurse. You can come here and do this. And I thought, thank God, because I, I was schooled out at that time. So I went to school here locally. I graduated from the University of Iowa's paramedic program. I did their critical care paramedic program and uh, rode on fire trucks and ambulances for a long period of time until 2010 when I decided I was going to go to the hospital end of things and I was going to do, um, you know, EMS system work right at a, at a level uh, in the hospital and stuff like that and oversee um, an EMS system and really kind of work on focusing them goals and lining them goals up with very much like the goals of, of cardiology and, and uh, the hospital here, right? So better outcomes for everybody that's here, best outcome every patient every time, right? Um, it's still the goal that we live today and part of our mission statement for um, EMS out there. So I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about EMS, pre-hospital care, and um, maybe some hopefully give you guys some information that you didn't really know about, um, things that we do, things that we can do, um, where we're going, where we were at, and where we've been. I put a couple pictures up on there. And before I get the thinking about it here, I probably need to make sure that I say uh, that. So I do have a regulatory, I'm a regulatory body. I only not only work for the hospital here, but for the Illinois Department of Public Health and uh, HHS, so the Iowa Health and Human Services um, in the state of Iowa. So I did put it in the slide because I always forget about it when we're doing hospital stuff here, but because you guys are from the outside and not hospital employees, I don't have any financial gain, right? They're not paying me anything more than a couple more pennies and I maybe get some free popcorn when I go home tonight uh, from the back back there. So um, so no financial gain or anything like that on this. And I don't, um, no big companies like Zoll or Phillips or any of those are paying me any kind of money. I'm still as poor as I was when I started working in EMS and I've got grandkids now. So they, they drain that. We had three kids, they drained the life out of me. And now I've got four grandkids that are draining the life out of me. So in my pocketbook too. So I guess I got to keep working. My wife's talking about retirement, but um she's pictured me working for a long time so pre-hospital care right we're going to take you back in the the time machine here back to emergency care and where it all started right so if you look back a long long time ago right we've been doing emergency care in the field um since about the civil war time right so anytime there was a big war anytime there was a battle right there had to be people there that took care of people and most of the time when we think about um you know, battles and wars and stuff like that. We think about the trauma aspect of thing and not necessarily the medical aspect of things. Um, but plenty of medical emergencies happen during during those uh, during those times too, right? And we've got a lot of good um, a lot of good uh, information and good science um, that kind of drives what we do pre-hospital wise out of some of that stuff. And about 1950 to 1960, somebody thought 
somebody goes unresponsive and you push hard and fast in the center of their chest, maybe, just maybe, they'll wake back up, right? Their heart will start again. The first creation of CPR, right? So that's when you start to see the AHA and the American Red Cross and some of these other organizations like start to start to come together and they start to put out information and papers and stuff like that. And you start to hear people talk about, you know, you just don't have a heart attack and die, right? There's things that we can do to keep the blood flowing until we can get you to the hospital and stuff like that. The 1960s is when we start to see the modern age of EMS born that was born with the Highway Safety uh, and Administrative Act and the White Papers. And a lot of this came upon um, in the 1960s because we started to see people going through uh, uh, the beginning of that baby boomer age and stuff like that, right? People were living a lot longer, right? People were starting to have health issues. We started to recognize some of the science behind um, how the heart pumps the feeds the organs, stuff like that. Um, and also because in the 1960s and 1970s, we were driving around in these great big metal cars with fast engines and stuff like that. And we get into an accident. And who was the EMS at that one time? Do you guys remember? Usually the funeral home, like they were double dipping into the ordeal, right? They show up, they throw you in the back, and they take you to a hospital that was more like a critical access hospital, like your doctor's office, right? And they go, oh my gosh, right? This isn't good. They didn't have the means of taking care of people. So in that 1960s and 1970s, you start to see bigger hospitals like hospitals that we have here, um, other trauma systems, um, larger facilities with more capability of treating people, admitting people to the hospital and stuff like that, and taking care of other diseases start to pop up. And that's all due to some of the stuff that was that came out of this white paper back in the early, late 60s, early 70s. And then you could see the first paramedic programs um, started to pop up in the late 1960s, early 1970s. The University of Iowa, where I went to school from, their first paramedic program was in 1971. I actually worked with the third licensed paramedic. That's kind of date my age there. The third licensed paramedic in the state of Iowa. So, and we worked together for at least probably six years before he finally ended up retiring. Um, and hanging it up, but he was one of the ones that went through the original class at the University of Iowa, which was a pilot program um, from the nation at some point in time because they didn't really kind of was like, okay, we've got an idea of what we're going to teach you, but we really don't know what we're going to teach you. So you're going to kind of learn on the fly and we're going to kind of go and adapt as it goes. And then you can see the profession kind of goes through and it updates your curriculum as it goes along, right? Been forward to today, right? And where we're at today. So a lot of the history of what we were doing, right, of paramedics and why we were doing some of this stuff wasn't just necessarily the trauma that was out there because where trauma does happen, it doesn't happen as often as cardiac related issues. And they're going through and they're doing a whole bunch of different classes uh, here. Um, she said Dr. Al was talking about hypertension, right, coming up here, this next one after me. And some of the things that we talked about today, pre-hospital wise, and the different um, segments that they're doing here really kind of comes back to that cardiac care and begins with cardiac care. So um, the original paramedic idea was based upon the need for rapid response to identify an emergency and care of victims from sudden cardiac death and acute myocardial infarctions, right? So it goes back to that 1950s, 1960s CPR stuff that we talked about up there. And the need for um, Folks to be able to access pre-hospital care so that we can get them from point A, whether that be their residence or um, you know uh, the restaurant or wherever, to point B, the hospital, and be able to give some level of care in there to keep them alive until we can get them to the specials, right? So again, that whole concept, all everything originated and based upon around um, the need for us to be able to treat cardiac related stuff out there in the field. So where are we today, right? So we've come a long ways from throwing people in the back of the ambulance, right? Or in the back of, of that white buggy that I had up on there on the very first picture and putting the foot to the floor, right? Driving as fast as we can to the hospital, right? So the, the went the other way. So the paramedics of the 21st century are highly trained healthcare professionals, right? 
in all aspects of things. So the folks that fly on helicopters from hospital to hospital are paramedics, right? We've got critical care paramedic teams that take um, patients, super sick patients um, from here. We'll do transfers up with Dr. Shadri's group up to Loyola with super, super sick heart patients, right? Um, or we'll transfer them to the University of Iowa or Peoria or whatever. Um, and I did that for a portion of my life, those long, those long term, long haul transfers um, to higher level of care institutions outside of here, right? So again, they're more than just ambulance drivers, right? I got to be careful using that phrase. So there's a guy that does education out there, or Bob Page, that's the ambulance drivers, right? So we're more than just ambulance drivers because we're delivering that um, highly skilled, highly trained um, healthcare to you folks. Um, not only from your house or your location to the hospital, but maybe from hospital to hospital that's out there. So where does this all begin and where does this all start? So you guys are all here at Trinity Rock Island, right? And I'm assuming that um, everybody knows somebody that's been treated here for probably some kind of a cardiac thing, or maybe you were treated for a cardiac thing, or you've been to our emergency rooms where you um, maybe um, are, are uh, being taken care of or uh, see some of our doctors and stuff like that in our clinics or our facilities and stuff like that out there. But here at uh, Rock Island, Rock Island specifically, we are a resource hospital in the state of Illinois. So this is where I put on the old regulatory cap there, right? And what I got to do. So currently in the state of Illinois, and I used to say that there was 63 hospitals, right? But there's only 61 now, and we seem to be dropping hospitals off like wildfire if you don't see the news there. Um, healthcare as a whole, right, is kind of working through a, a new phase of its time, whether you're a hospital or you're a rural ambulance service or um, you're a fire department or a city, even a city service, right, trying to figure out how we continue to offer this high quality care, right, um, in the economy that we're in. But we're a resource hospital here in the state of Illinois, and as being a resource hospital, um, what does that mean? That means that we um, as a resource hospital, provide medical oversight to three hospital providers out there in the field. Because um, unlike uh, the days for Johnny and Roy that I had on the first slide up there, right? You guys don't remember that, right? I'm um, out there. We have medical direction, so we work underneath the medical director. It's not just freelance and cowboy stuff out there. It's not all about popping the ends off the tubes and starting two large war IVs, D five W, right? getting them for the hospital, right? It's not about that stuff. It's not as cool as it was, but that sounded very cool. And that was kind of like how it drew me in at first. I was like, man, I'm gonna get to do this cool stuff. And I realized I was like, man, you don't really always get to do all that cool stuff. So, um, but we're a resource hospital here. So that means we provide that medical oversight. So uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Barr, um, who is one of our uh, board certified emergency room physicians is the EMS systems medical director. Um, <coughs> here in um, the, the Quad Cities region. So he took over for Dr. Bradley, um, Walter Bradley in 2008. Um, Dr. Bradley served as the EMS medical director here since the creation of the EMS system back in 1980. So he put his time in. Um, well do, uh, well served uh, individual and highly respected um, emergency room physician in the community and the state. Um, but Dr. Barr took over um, as medical director in 2008. When I first met him, I asked him, because he's from Northern Iowa. He went out to um, Wake County, uh, North Carolina to get his uh, doctrine for a uh, doctor out there. And I said, why did you go out there to do that? Did you know you were gonna be an EMS medical director? Because um, Wake County, Wake County EMS is on the forefront of EMS care out there nationwide, hands down. They run pilot projects and a lot of the stuff that we do here is based upon some of the pilot projects um, that they do there. A lot of the stuff that Illinois uses as the four level protocols or protocols that he's developed and he's brought here to this community. As we look at evidence based practice of how do we give the folks in the community that live in live in here and that we serve the best possible care for the best possible outcomes. And he told me it was because that the bass fishing out there was phenomenal. So um, big time outdoors. And he's got a bunch of little kids. Kids are younger than me, but he's older than me. He just started a little bit later in life, I think, um, on having uh, having children. But a wealth of knowledge in EMS, right? And all of that stuff that goes on. Um, and again, we still kind of try and base our protocols um, all the time. Um, everything that we're doing, I was just having a conversation with uh, 
one of the ED physicians today about pre-hospital 12 leads and stuff like that, EKGs that we are sending in. Again, we're always trying to make sure that we keep on the forefront uh, the newest, best technology out there so that it's evidence-based so that we can provide good quality care to everybody out there. So he provides that medical oversight with his medical license to everybody else that's out here, right? To the dispatcher that calls 911, that you guys call 911, that answers the call and says 911, what's your emergency, right? We provide the protocols, the questions that they ask you, right? They're all done through the EMS system. Um, and it's like, a, if you've you ever read one of those books where you get to the bottom page there and it says, if you want to do this, go to page 82. If you want to see this, go to page 158. That's exactly how that program is written and designed. So if you say yes, it'll move on to a different page. If you say no, it goes to a totally different mm -hmm. ordeal on there. So when you call 911, um, I will tell you, those dispatchers, I thought I had a card out there. Try having to talk to somebody on the phone and give instructions to them on any kind of thing when they're in a panic. Those guys and gals, they're saints, okay? Two, the ambulance drivers, right? That's supposed to be me, right? Out there driving the ambulances, driving the fire trucks, coming to your house, providing that first response medical care, getting you loaded up in the ambulance and getting you taken to the hospital so that you guys can get that continuance of care and further treatment. And then obviously all the folks that are here in the emergency department that are there to help take care of you, right? Get you the help you need for the services through cardiology or the other folks here at the hospital so that you can get better and you can continue to live life. So why do we do all of this? I have any of you guys have been to any of the other um, Heart the hearts, right? You probably have heard the term, right? Time is muscle, right? So it is, it's muscle. So from the minute that you start having some kind of cardiac related symptoms, chest pain, tightness, right? Palpation, burning, stabbing. You can go on and on and on. Probably the worst heart attack I seen was this uh, little old lady that we had. She was probably about 60 some years old. She was so apologetic. It's like six o'clock in the morning. She goes, Oh my gosh. She goes, I am so sorry. She goes to call you guys here. And it's like, no, it's no big deal. Complaining of a pain of one in the middle of her back. We hooked her up. She was having the biggest heart attack I think I've ever seen. Like I looked at my partner and he was looking at it and I said, you need to start driving now. Right. And probably for about, oh, she still lives uh, down in the town that we picked her up in. Um, but um, she used to bring us salsa like three or four times during the summer. Um, every year, homemade salsa um, for just doing a really good job. And we go, say, no, no, we can't take it. It's like, no, we're going to take it. So, but either way, right? Um, was having the worst heart attack and had zero complaint. She was just more upset that she woke us up that early in the morning because she was playing it on. She goes, I just couldn't kind of stand sitting anymore. She goes, I was getting antsy. So I finally just called, you, right? So, again, everything comes down to time, right? And wait. Um, you're never inconveniencing any of the folks in the pre-hospital ordeal. Because if you're using this, you're using this because it's an emergency. Right? That's what we're there for, right? We're there for you when there's an emergency. So time is muscle. So making sure that as soon as you are feeling right, right, as soon as you have any of those signs and symptoms that if you're a follower of a follower of this uh, these series that they're doing here and stuff like that, you guys know all about them, right? That you activate the system. You call 911 and you get folks come. Because it does still take an old guy like me every once in a while if I'm riding the ambulance, time to get up out of bed, get my shoes on, get out of the truck, wipe the sleep out of my eyes and the drool off my face before I present myself to you, right? So why is it important, right? Because um, MIs, heart attacks, right, evolve, uh, evolve, right, from ischemia, right, or that's the, the heart not being happy, right, to infarct, right? It's an evolving process, and it happens. Usually not like that. It's not like flipping the light switch, right, where, you know, oh, just having a heart attack. It happens over time, and if we can catch it early, in the ischemic phase, right? We can keep it from going to the infarct phase because that's definitely not where we want it at. Infarct means death of heart, right? 
Ischemic means it's not happy, right? Just like my kids, I know how to keep them happy, right? We can make your heart happy. We can do things in the pre-hospital setting to start that process to keep it from going to the infarct way. That's why it's so important to make sure that you guys utilize pre-hospital services. That's what we're there for. Sometimes I get questions and they say, well, I don't really know if it's an emergency. I always tell them, if you're thinking about calling 911, then it is an emergency, right? So just call 911. It's not that big of a deal. You're never, ever going to have any of our folks show up that are going to say, now, we don't think you're sick enough to go to the hospital, right? It's usually, do you want to go to the hospital? If you do, which hospital do you want to go to? Because we'll load you up and we'll take it. We'll get you going. And then we'll provide care on the way there. So as the infarct evolves, we can see EKG changes. And EKGs are something that uh, historically, just like anything else that was that's evolved, right? Uh, it's kind of had leaps and valleys and pills. Um, I've got some old EKG machines that are downstairs um, <coughs> that are ones that haven't I'm probably used in uh, 20 to 30 years, right? They're antiques or collectibles. Um, to some of the new technology and the new equipment that we got out there right now, that um, my paramedics that are out there in the field can do an EKG and we can send it, transmit it to the hospital within milliseconds. ED doctor could be looking at it and say, yep, that's a heart attack. Get the cardiologist on the phone. We need to get him in there. Which again, shortens that time. Time is muscle. So again, we can see those EKG uh, changes as they evolve. And we can rule out, you know, if you're not having a heart attack, right? Sometimes you might feel like you're having a heart attack. We might put you on the monitor and we might say, well, it looks good. You're not having a heart attack, or at least we don't see any signs of you having a heart attack on the monitor. So we can see as the EKG develops, right, changes. So initially EKGs may show taller hyperacute T waves. These are significant. They represent cardiac ischemia. They might only be present for a short time, so five to 30 minutes. So why don't we see them without reading the bottom notes that are down on there? Because I forgot to cut them up. Because most folks are having that chest pain, right? Like, it's like, oh, like maybe it was just tacos I was eating, right? It's just heartburn. It's not a heart attack, right? And I wait. I don't call, right? 30 minutes goes by, and I still don't feel good, right? And I've probably taken my antacids and stuff like that. I still don't feel good. So, and then all of a sudden, my wife goes, "Hey, ding dong, you need to call 911. You're not acting right. You're not looking right. Right? You're not feeling right." And we miss it, right? Because it's only in that short time period, maybe five to 30, 45 minutes. Um, and us guys, we're bad about that kind of stuff, right? It'll go away. Ain't no big deal, right? We just wait, and we miss it, right? We get past that ischemic phase. We start moving it into that infarct phase, and that infarct phase is where the heart muscle starts to die. <clears throat> so I'm going to blow your mind with all kinds of stuff that we've been doing um, since um, the Johnny and Roy days of EMS out there, right? So some of my services, all my services now, um, and pre-hospital 12 weeks has become a standard of care. When I first got here, I came from across the river and I worked in a large uh, EMS system uh, across the river, and we were probably about three years into doing EKGs and stuff like that and, and transmitting them to the hospital when I got here. And I remember meeting with uh, uh, Rock Island Fire and like, so, you know, you guys are transmitting 12 leads to the hospital. And she goes, no, we're not even doing 12 leads. So not even doing 12 leads. He goes, nope. He goes, too close to the hospital. Don't need to do it, right? So after begging and pleading, and he went to uh, city council, um, Probably about 2012, they, they started doing 12 leads down in Rock Island. And the number of cardiac alerts, probably the better outcomes that have become of some of that stuff. Um, the initial data that we collected and presented to city council in the first couple of years paid for in citizens' lives saved and better outcomes paid for that machinery down there, right? They'll never go backwards again, right? That's where it is. It's a standard of care. It's the gold standard of care out there. Um, all of the services uh, do that. Um, there's a Helmsley, uh, Helmsley Trust Foundation um, that's out of uh, North South Dakota. Sorry, South Dakota. Um, big foundation. You can Google it out there. They've donated a lot of money 
uh, through Mission Lifeline and through different uh, projects here to the hospital for us to have that receiving uh, technology so that we can receive those 12 leads from the field. They've donated money to first responders and stuff like that out there in the field to put those monitors in every ambulance so that every ambulance can provide that gold quality standard of care um, to the citizens that they serve. I've got uh, services um, in the Iowa side, so down in Muscatine, uh, Muscatine Fire, um, if any of you guys are from Muscatine, they've been doing field troponins for probably five years now, right? So it's troponin, those blood tests that they do, the labs that they do in the hospital, they're rolling them out there in the field, and they've got a quick test that costs a, a pretty penny, right? Out there that they can drop that blood on and they can tell them if there's elevated markers in there that say that, you got a sketchy looking 12 lead that you're probably having a heart attack and should go to a center that has PCI. So again, Muscatine is about 40 minutes, 45 minutes south of here. It's a 40 minute drive up here. Or it's a 40 minute drive to the University of Iowa, right? We have a critical access hospital down there, but we don't have the cardiology resources like we have up here at Rock Island and Bettor. So they can use those tools to make sure that they get that you guys, the patients, to the right place, right, the first time, right, so that they can get those cardiac cares. And then we've been doing other uh, different labs out there in the field that kind of help um, further diagnose and further redefine for cardiology services and emergency services like um, CPKs and CPKMs and stuff like that with ISAT machinery out there in the field. So really, what are you getting when you're getting an ambulance? You're almost getting a full service ER minus the doctor and the cardiologist there, right? Because we're running the test, we're doing all this stuff, we're sending it in. Um, my doctors are looking at it in the emergency department because they can see it in real time. And we're making that decision that goes back to that initial slide about time being muscle, right? Better benefit of you guys, right? So is it important to call 911? <laughs> I bet it's important to call 911. In fact, we're not really a taxi service, right? We're here for you guys. We're there to take you guys to the hospital. We're there to provide that upfront care and stop that process from ischemia to infarct. So we talked about chest pain and stuff like that, and I wanted to kind of highlight some of the cardiac arrest stuff that we, we do here too. So um, from EMS system, right? Um, and it, I always thought maybe it was going to be too good to be true that I would just get a job where I had to worry about ambulances. But um, EMS systems here at the hospital so that I oversee, we also have an education program where we educate um, EMS or pre-hospital people up to the critical care paramedic level. Our classes start back again. Mm -hmm. Uh, September, and if anybody wants to go out there and be an EMS person, you can get a hold of me afterwards because we're looking for plenty. Or you can go to school and be a nurse. We're looking for nurses too. So, um, but um, emergency preparedness flops underneath here. So for the hospitals, so you can imagine I was a little bit busy during COVID-19 for the two years that we were in public health pandemic around here. But um, the American Heart Association, they thought, hey, you know a little bit something about saving lives and doing that. You did it out there in the field. So the American Heart Association classes, AHA and CPR falls underneath um, uh, EMS systems as well. So I oversee all the people that go out there and do the AHA CPR training um, in the local area. So cardiac arrest, what it is, it's electrical malfunction in the heart that causes irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias and it disrupts blood flow to the brain, lungs, and other important organs. When the blood stops, right, those organs stop getting perfused, they get ischemic just like the heart does, right? When the brain gets ischemic because it's not getting oxygen-rich blood, uses like 60% of your glucose, right, your sugar storage and your oxygen, 80% of it in there, keep it, keep it running. When it stops losing that oxygen, it starts to die, right? So each year, more than 350,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests occur in the United States. This is why large organizations like um, the American Heart Association, um, American Stroke Association as well, right, um, devote time and resources, right, to research cardiac arrests, right, how we can drive that number down. So when a person has a cardiac arrest event, survival depends on immediately receiving CPR from someone 
nearby. So here we are back to the 1950s, 1960s thing, right? We come full circle with all kinds of gadgets that have been out there and given drugs and this is and that and doing mouth to mouth CPR and because you had to do it, right? That's what would save a life. Back to just one simple idea, right? Push hard, push fast in the center of, a, of the chest. You can save a life, right? So CPR, specially performed immediately, can double or even triple cardiac arrest victims' chance of survival. You say, Adam, how do you know that stuff, right? What do you, where, where do you get your information from besides maybe buy stuff from the American Heart Association, right? It's their business, right? Like anything else. So back in 2000 and 17, probably, it was before COVID, maybe 16. I don't know, kind of escapes me sometimes there, right? We started a thing in, uh, with Rock Island Fire called the Ross Trials, right? So what's Ross stand for? The stands for return of spontaneous circulation, all right? So this was done on every patient um, in Rock Island Fire's area, use them as a the test subject, right? And we said that when you go on arrest, or you go on a call for cardiac arrest, right? You get there to the house, what you're going to do is you're going to perform all these life-saving skills, right? But you're going to focus on doing high-quality CPR on that individual, so you get a pulse back, right? So put the airway in, bag them, hook up your monitor, do IVs, get drugs. Really focus in on doing high-quality CPR. So before we were doing that, chances of getting somebody back or maybe about 15%, right? We get called to your house, somebody's in cardiac arrest, 15% of the time we were getting them back. By doing that for one year, 48% return of spontaneous circulation out there in the field. Doing some of the fancy stuff, but going back to the basics, right? Of just making sure we were pushing hard and pushing fast, right? This is really before we started doing some super education too on the public of before we get there, you can push hard and fast too, right? And that even more increases that rate. When we see bystander CPR, we're talking up in the 60s, almost 70% return of spontaneous circulation. And I kind of cut it off down there, but you can see down there, it was 38% just discharged from the hospital a lot. So that 48%, 38% of those folks that came into the hospital, excuse me, into the hospital, got discharged alive back to home, back to a nursing home, walked out of here, right? Those are huge numbers, right? So this is now current practice for my whole entire EMS system, right? So whether you live out in Geneseo or you're down in Muscatine or you're up in Clinton or you're in Moline, East Moline, Rock Island, right? All these folks, right? Even across the river over in Davenport do this, right? Because we know that better outcomes, right? A good high quality CPR lead to better outcomes for people making it out of the hospital. So if you're called to perform CPR in an emergency, you most likely try to save a life of someone that you know or love, right? Child, spouse, parent, or friend, 70% of out of hospital cardiac arrest happens in the home. It just does. About 46% of people who experience out of hospital cardiac arrest receive immediate help that they need before professional arrives. Why is that number so low? Well, has anybody heard of hands-only CPR? Hopefully you guys heard it, seen it, maybe out there on the camp over right? So some people, and when we went and did uh, the big hands-only with the, uh, we were doing it with Pat Schaust and the gang, uh, Mary McCumden Schmidt's uh, former boss, right, um, for the, the foundation. We're going out there and we're doing hands-only CPR at all these fairs and stuff like that and really pushing it and stuff. And I always used to, do a presentation and I said, you know, and I said, the reason why people, you know, in the day, right, the dispatcher would tell you, okay, so, you know, are they breathing? They're not breathing. Okay, so what I want you to do is pinch their nose, right, and pull down their jaw and then breathe into their mouth. And people are like, mm, don't really know about that, right? I just tell everybody, right, I love my wife, right? I love her to death, but Fortunately, sometimes people that go into cardiac arrest, they vomit, right? And I just don't know. I said, if I could live with that. I start my kids, you know, I would do mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR on my kids. Hands down, my grandkids, no problem, right? But 
she is sometimes does a couple extras. She was standing in the back of the room and she's just going. Right. So that number is low because of that common misconception, because people thought I don't want to do mouth to mouth, right? I don't know this person, right? I'm willing to help, but I don't want to put my mouth on their mouth, right? And do mouth to mouth. So science has showed us through the American Heart Association by just doing hands only CPR is to be just as effective as conventional CPR. So CPR with giving breasts when they're at home, work or in public places, right? So just push hard and push fast, right? And you'll save a life. Just as effective, right? You don't have to worry about swap and spit with somebody else, right? <laughs> so hands only CPR is just two easy steps, right? First thing you need to do, right? Don't panic. Call 911, right? And then push hard and fast in the center of the chest. I always get the people like, oh, we gotta push hard and fast. It's it. Before you push hard and fast, call 911. Make sure the other rescuers are coming, right? You're gonna do a good job of rescuing them. But make sure that the ambulance folks are on their way too, right? Don't want to steal on our jobs, right? But push hard and fast in the center of the chest, right? Up to about 120 beats a minute, right? Sometimes you gotta gotta think of a, of a, a famous song in your mind, right? To doing it, right? So 100 to 120 compressions per minute is where we want to go, right? That's about as fast as we need to push that pump to circulate that already oxygen rich blood that's sitting in your body. So sometimes people feel more confident performing hands only CPR, like doing it. They're trained to a familiar song. I think you guys know which one I'm talking about. We'll play it here in a second for you. Uh, but again, hands only CPR is a natural introduction to CPR and it encourages everybody, right? We were doing uh, hands only CPR uh, back, I think it was 2018, and we had a gal that was in here and she was working for UDS and she was up front and she was cleaning, right? So we had just done hands only CPR training because they don't get regular CPR training in the hospital and stuff like that. A guy pulled up his wife was in cardiac arrest in the car and she remembered the training, right? She yelled for somebody to call, get help, right? Help pull the, the gal out of the car with her husband. Did hands only CPR and there was a great outcome from it, right? So in through the emergency department, down to the cath lab with uh, the cardiologist. I think Dr. Purdy was the doctor, um, and she ended up discharging from the hospital, right? So things like that, little things end up saving a lot. So um, questions for me? Yeah. How often do ribs get broken? Because a lot of people have. Yep. So yeah. So if you put your hands in the right position, right on the mannequin, and this I told. Randy back there, I said, I got a table for two, right? So my day for the night. But if you uh, if you uh, put your hands in the correct place on the sternum in there, um, you don't, you won't necessarily break ribs, right? But the longer you do chest compressions and people get tired, sometimes they slip off. The good thing about it is, and I'm not going to uh, take anything away from our cardiology service line, but our trauma surgeons here do a great job of putting ribs so we can fix that. We can't fix somebody that doesn't receive CPR, right? And we don't circulate that blood and they die, right? We circulate that blood, we get their heart rate back, their heart rhythm back, right? We can go in there, we can fix the ribs. Good question. It does happen time to time, yeah. Um, you said that usually when someone is having a, a heart attack or, you know, they'll vomit. So if you have to give CPR, do you have to be concerned about them choking on their own vomit? Yeah, so I mean, again, I would recommend hands only CPR. It's just as effective as going mouth to mouth. So I don't, there's no real benefit shown, proven, right, in response times from the time either police get there with a, a bag valve mask to give breaths or the ambulance or the fire department. You've got almost eight to 10 minutes of uh, oxygen that's in your blood there, right? And if we start pumping the chest, right, we're circulating that through. So there's, I would focus in on just doing more good quality chest compressions than worrying about giving that any kind of breaths. So then you don't have, then it takes that whole situation out of it. But if they vomit, you tip, tip their head to the yeah. side. So it you, you can tip their, you can tip their head to the side, yeah, right? Or else right. when they get there, they can so suction they it out. Aspirate, right? They, if they vomited, they've already aspirated. So, oh, okay. All right. You, you're not, you know, so again, they're not, no longer alive, right? So if it comes up, it's going to go back down, and there's nothing to stop from going back down like that. So you can tip their head to the side, or the paramedics when they get there can certainly take care of them. How do you determine where on the chest you're pushing? 
I mean, it yes. used to be there was a certain distance yep. or whatever. Good, uh, good question. So you're going to place one hand on top of the other hand, right in the center of the chest, right about nipple line. Okay. So right about there, about mid sternum, mid to the lower portion of the sternum there. One hand over top of the other and push hard and fast. Good question. Sir. So I think there's the so what's a defibrillator? So the defibrillator, so our AEDs and stuff like that that we use. So um, you uh, remember, I think it was probably that uh, cardiac arrest slide that said in there that Usually how people go into cardiac arrest, they develop an arrhythmia, right? So an arrhythmia is uh, an uh, irregular electrical beat of the heart, right? So what a defibrillator does is it sends electricity from one pad to another pad across the chest to try and get that back into a normal rhythm, right? So uh, folks that have implanted defibrillators, right, that's constantly doing it on their own. We can manually do that when we see the arrhythmia on the screen and try and get it back in there. In fact, um, an arrhythmia, um, as it presents, um, the sooner that we can correct that arrhythmia with electricity, the better, the higher the chance of success for, for ROSC um, in a patient. So the monitors that do the 12 leads also shock like that as well. They're, they're defibrillators. They're monitors slash defibrillators that are out there. And then, of course, there's um, you walk out here by our cafeteria um, or you go to the airport or even IV and stuff like that, there's defibrillators. That's another big program that cardiology has helped support um, out there in the community. Churches and stuff like that um, have AEDs or, or automated defibrillators that are on the wall. Good question. I have an artificial lift. I can't do two hands. How, how likely am I going to be to use one hand? So I always, I always get that, right? So somebody goes, I can't push deep enough, right? Can't get the chest to go all the way down and reflect it. Anything's better than nothing, right? I would so if you can push a little bit, you can get that heart to squeeze a little bit. We're squeezing more blood. We're squeezing some blood. Some blood's better than no blood. Good question. So you say with quality CPR. Yeah. In that context, what is good? And also, so an, an, if an obese person, they would done it. How many people see it actually? So and doing, and doing CPR. So right? not, that's how do you lecture? Yeah. Have them start doing it. Do this. That's yep. So they go down, right? And you just start doing it. So you say good quality CPR. What's that look like, right? So, and, and I'm, I brought this man come up so that you guys can, uh, uh, obviously, after we're done here, you can come up and you can uh, put your hands on. And you can see what it takes to push this down. So this is a weighted spring mannequin. So this is supposed to um, give an example of about 160 to 180 pound um, guy, right? Um, for for pressing, right? So as I press down here, this is this is a lot. This is spring weighted, right? As it goes down, right? You have to press till this thing clicks, and then two green lights over here on the side means that I'm doing about 120 to 100 to 120 compressions per minute, right? You can imagine as I do this, I'm waiting for the ambulance to get there. I'm getting all tired, right? Keep singing. Yeah, I keep singing, right? So, you know, and again, that's staying alive, right? You can do that. Uh, I got a guy that helps teach with me to row, row, row your boat, right? And again, the success rate in this, like I said, um, from what we've done with some of the Ross trials and we looked at who is doing pre-hospital just CPR, right? Whether it be conventional or whether it was hands-only CPR, we were seeing that Ross rate uh, jump up higher uh, into the, the 60s, the 60 percent time. So again, you know, it it's all about getting on the chest and getting on the chest quick and fast. So when they go down, trust me, if they're not having a heart attack and you start doing this on their chest, they're gonna wake up and they're gonna tell you to stop, right? <laughs> it's gonna hurt, okay? And then you go, yes, that's a save, right? <laughs> Gotta save. Questions, other questions? Man. Couple more. Speeding up the other thing. So, the defibrillator, the AED, and CPR. Would the CPR first, and yeah. looking at somebody else around can go find that if you're find it. Yeah, or the first responders get there and bring it in. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always CPR first, pump that blood, right? Good question. And then we'll do here, one more over here. I got here a little late. Did you say anything about if a person feels they're still conscious about taking aspirin or anything? 
So good question. So part of some of the, you know, we talked about dispatch a little bit and stuff like that. So my dispatch center will give you instructions to take baby aspirin if you have it, or even an adult aspirin if you're having chest pain, right? Because we know that that aspirin, it makes the, your blood in your body not so sticky, right? It makes it slippery. Usually when you have blockages in your heart, it's because your blood thickens up, starts to clot together, and it, it, it occludes an area of your heart. Makes this you make it not happen. Awesome. Awesome. Well, help me give a round of applause. <laughs> so I feel much more confident now with how to respond if somebody is uh, possibly having a heart attack. So that was great. So, Adam, can I get you up here so we can um, give away this beautiful basket? So, go ahead and pick a lucky number. And it is, oh, it's my number. <laughs> Five, six, six, eight, nine, seven. Who's the lucky one tonight? Oh, there six, we eight, go. Nine, seven. There you go. Okay, awesome. Well, before you go, um, thank you. Uh, I just want to highlight your popcorn. Um, let me grab this. My voice doesn't carry. The popcorn tonight, um, we've got it was sprinkled with a little nutritional yeast. So what are the secret gems in nutritional yeast? Hardly any salt, two tablespoons has 30 milligrams. Two tablespoons also has seven grams of fiber and 13 grams of protein, okay? So um, uh, it's just um, a way of adding nutrition and a little flavor too. So there's some in your recipe, in your um, Registration packet, you've got a couple other ideas for seasoning there, but um, this is, um, I get the instructions for a stove top, no oil uh, popcorn, just using old fashioned kernels of popcorn. I also want to um, emphasize that um, you can sign up here. We've got, Randy's got the sign up for the limited panels if you want to do that. Date September 7th, I think, and 20th, October 9th, and 29th. So um, go ahead and get that scheduled. Um, we'll be sending out notifications also if you're on our email list too to get that done. So thank you so much and you have a great evening.